Now that we've introduced the idea of stress concentrators, what else do we need to know about fracture mechanics? Well, along comes Griffith's theory of brittle fracture, and it has uh, some assumptions. First off, it says all materials have some flaws in them, right? And these flaws can be described in terms of size and orientation and their distribution throughout the material. So if you've got some material over here, it actually has flaws all the way through it. But one flaw might be the largest and the most severe of all of them. So even those even though all of these would experience some stress magnification in their vicinity of the cracked tip, this one's going to experience the largest stress magnification. Therefore, it's the one that's eventually going to fracture. Crack, the, that crack is going to be the one that grows all the way across. Okay? So fracture occurs when your maximum stress, right, the, the, the maximum stress at the vicinity of that cracked tip, equals the yield strength for that material, right? Um, and we know that this works because when you make really small ceramics, we call them whiskers, which is just like nanoscale ceramics, really, really small, the odds of you having flaws in that are also quite small. And these materials reach almost the theoretical strength for what you'd expect for materials to have, right? Because they're so small, they don't have flaws. But the bigger and bigger your components, you tend to have more and more severe flaws. They get larger, there's more of them, um, and they typically, this is why things break at lower and lower stresses as you move from really small volumes to larger and larger volumes, just more flaws. Now, as you do this, uh, you need, what the next thing they did is, well, let's balance two things. On one hand, as you stretch a material, you're moving it into an area where it has elastic energy strain building up in it, right? What do we mean by that? Well, let's plot energy versus interatomic separation. So we've got energy up here, interatomic separation, and for some material, we know that at zero Kelvin and under no stress, we're right here at R naught. That's what our atom to atomic separation distance is, and that corresponds to some energy, E naught, okay? But as you pull on something, you're stretching the lattice out from where it would like to be. Let's say you pull all the way out over here to R1, right? Therefore, it has a new energy that it's at. It's over here at E1, right? Meaning, if you pulled on this until it reached that point and all of a sudden it broke, well, it can go down in energy relative to where it is in that state. It can go down back to its initial energy state, right? So this is the lattice or elastic strain energy that's building up in your material. And releasing that favors crack growth, right? That is a good thing for crack formation because it says, great, if I just if I just extend this crack a little bit further, I can get rid of all that elastic strain energy building up. On the other hand, as you create a surface in a material, we know that surfaces cost energy, right? So you've got this little crack in your material. And all along this crack, that's where the atoms would like to be bonded to each other vertically, but they can't because there's a crack there. And even though you're going to release strain energy by extending that crack further out, we know that we're also going to be making it so there's more surface area where bonds aren't being bonded. And so uh, there's an enthalpic reason why there's a surface energy there. And so that is not allowing crack to go forward, right? So the whole key here was to balance these two things. It said, okay, let's balance the energy benefit from uh, reducing our lattice strain with the energy penalty of creating new surfaces. And this allowed them to calculate a critical stress, sigma c. And, you know, they basically said it's equal to 2 times the modulus times gamma s. Gamma s is your specific surface energy, right? And then pi divided by pi times a, your half crack length, take this whole thing to the square root, okay? Um, and that's assuming for a sharp crack. Well, then they modified it, and they took into account other nuances. They said, well, all right, what if it's a material that can deform a little bit, so there's plastic deformation? Now you have to account gamma p, that's your plastic deformation energy. And so if it's a really ductile material, then you end up with gamma p dominating your surface energy. And so that can be uh, the expression for a ductile material. But the whole idea was taking into account the lattice strain with the surface energy or plastic deformation. Okay. Now, there are different modes possible. Um, in this class, we're going to cover just the most simple because this is just an introduction to material science. We're going to consider mode uh, right there. It's called mode one. And that's when you're pulling on this thing up here and down here, and that crack propagates orthogonal to it, right, into the material. That's called mode one fracture. So we're not pulling it in and out. We're not twisting it side to side. We're just pulling up and down. Uh, in other classes of mechanics, you will learn about these other modes, and they have different solutions. Okay? We're also going to uh, look at two scenarios. You've got thin plate. We call this plane stress. In that case, your stress in the z direction is basically equal to zero. And then you've got 
thick plates where you have plane strain condition. In that case, your strain in the z direction is basically equal to zero. We're only going to consider one of these scenarios, and that's this one right here. We're going to consider the plane strain solution to mode one fracture, okay? And that has the following equation. K is equal to y, which is a dimensionless geometric parameter, which depends on the crack and the specimen size and geometry, multiplied by the stress applied, multiplied by pi times the half crack length A. Okay, So K is uh, our stress intensity factor base. Remember, this is equal to the maximum stress div divided by the stress that you think you're applying, essentially that is. So it's the multiplier. If you're mul This is saying that the multiplier that you're going to see is equal to some stress parameter, the applied stress, um, multiplied by some geometry, basically the size of your crack. All right. Now, what is y, this geometric shape parameter? Unless we say otherwise, you should use the value of 1.12 in this class. What can the value actually be? It totally depends, right? Consider these scenarios. Let's say you've got a surface crack right here, and it has the distance of a, but the overall material has some distance w. Well, y is a function of a over w, right? It starts out at 1.12 right there, that's 1.12, but it gets large. It can get all the way up to, in this case, 4, right? So what does that mean? It means that as the crack moves through the material, when the crack is really small relative to the width A, right? So A over W, when that approaches 0, this thing is at 1.12. But as A over W reaches 0 0.5, right? When that crack is moved halfway through your material, this thing is now much higher. It could be as high as, well, let's look at it. What, like two and a half maybe, okay? So why changes, why changes as you are, um, as the crack propagates through your material, why does not stay constant unless it fractures in this low limit where it's basically flat, right? This line right here is basically flat in this low limit. Okay, that is the idea behind uh, Griffith fracture theory. Flaws exist in your material. We balance the strain versus the, the surface energy, and we can calculate this critical stress intensity factor when you get failure if you know the a certain conditions, like the type of fracture you're talking about, uh, the plane strain versus mode one, and the size of your flaw.